Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Uh, Mr. President, um, I am here now for, I guess, the uh, 87th consecutive week that the Senate has been in session to uh, urge action on uh, climate change. Um, we've had an interesting couple of weeks on the Keystone Pipeline, um, but from a climate change and carbon pollution point of view, this would obviously not be helpful. Indeed, it would be a disaster, leading to as much as 27 million, 27 million metric tons of additional carbon dioxide emitted per year. To put that number into some perspective, that is the equivalent of adding 6 million cars and trucks to our roads for 50 years. So it's a very, very considerable carbon price to pay. We have seen a poster used on the Senate floor that says it will have no environmental effect. Uh, that is not precisely true. Indeed, precisely the opposite is true. This is the environmental effect it will have, and it is considerable. What the report then went on to say was that it would be offset by the fact that this fuel would go out by rail anyway, but that offset was conditioned on a fuel price above $75 per barrel of oil, and we are at 50. So there is just no way that that conclusion can stand, and the underlying fact is what prevails, 27 million metric tons of additional carbon dioxide. So it's obviously very bad from an environmental perspective. It's a lot of not much from a jobs perspective. Every four days, we uh, add more jobs than the construction of this pipeline, just through the economic recovery that's taking place. Um, and it is a little bit hard to explain, except uh, particularly when you think that this bill is going to be dead on arrival at the White House. We've known from the beginning that this is going to be vetoed. Um, but it has allowed the oil uh, and the fossil fuel industry to show their hands. This is all being done on behalf of a foreign oil company and on behalf of the fossil fuel industry. And when you look at what we've been through in the past couple of days, there are some interesting choices that the Senate has made. If you are a foreign oil company, if you are a foreign, foreign oil company, we will let you use eminent domain to extinguish the property rights of farmers and ranchers and take their farms and ranches away. If you are a foreign oil company, uh, we will exempt you from the oil spill recovery fund, the federal excise tax on petroleum, so that you don't have to pay the taxes that American companies do. If you are a uh, foreign oil company, we will not require you to use American steel in a pipeline being crossed being built across America that's being touted as a source of American jobs. If you are a foreign oil company, we won't require you to sell it in the American market, even though it's touted as a product that will help uh, balance America's energy portfolio. So, so far, not much good to show for all of this, but one thing, and that is that this exercise has at last brought the issue of climate change to the floor of the Senate. We have not had much debate about climate change since the Citizens United decision back in 2010 allowed the fossil fuel industry to cast a very long shadow of uh, intimidation across this body. They spend a huge amount of the money that has been freed up by Citizens United. They spend a huge amount of the dark money that flows post Citizens United. And since then, the Republican Party has been virtually muzzled on that subject. So having Republicans talk about climate change on the Senate floor was something of a revelation, and I don't think we should uh, underestimate the importance of that or undervalue what was said. Um, the senior senator from North Carolina came to the floor, and he said this, the concept that climate change is real, I completely understand and accept. To the point of how much man is contributing, I don't know, but it does make sense that man-made emissions are contributing. And the global warming effect, the greenhouse gas effect, seems to me scientifically sound. The problem is how we fix this globally is going to require more than just the United States to be involved, which I think we all 
agree with. The senior senator from Alaska, who is our uh, chairman of the Energy Committee and the floor manager on this very bill, uh, agreed, stating that she hopes that we can, I'll quote her, get beyond the discussion as to whether or not climate change is real and talk about what do we do. So I look forward to that discussion about what do we do. It's not enough just to say, okay, we finally concede that climate change is really happening. We really do have to get on to what do we do. Even if you disagree with me that climate change is real and very significant and consequential for our country, if you'll spot me that there's just a 10% chance that I'm right, even just a 2% chance that I'm right, when you consider the possible harms, it's something that grown-up, adult, and responsible people ought to take a look at and come together and decide what to do. We've been through some very notable benchmarks. We hit for the first time uh, last year 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere for more than three months. They've been tracking this in Hawaii, at the top of the mountain at the Mauna Loa Observatory for decades now. And 400 parts per million for more than three months is a new record. And to put that in context, for as long as human beings have been on this planet, all the way back to when we were living in caves, the range of carbon in the atmosphere has been 170 to 300 parts per million. So we're well outside the range that has been our comfortable, safe range for human habitation of this planet during our entire human experience. And 400 is a big, big move when your entire range is only 130 points and now you're 100 parts per million out of that. Some of this lands in the oceans. The oceans have absorbed about a quarter of all of our carbon emissions, and you can actually go and you measure their pH level. This isn't complicated. This is not something that you have to do with elaborate computer models. And what you see is that the pH level of the oceans is changing rapidly. The oceans are acidifying rapidly. And when I say rapidly, they're acidifying at a rate that we have not seen in 25 to perhaps 30 or 50 million years. Indeed, some studies say nothing like this has been seen on the face of the Earth for as long as 300 million years. And when you consider that our species has been around for about 200,000 years, that's a pretty long window to be launching new and dramatic changes uh, in our oceans. There's nothing new about the science that supports this. John Tyndall wrote the first report about the greenhouse gas effect uh, to the uh, British Academy of Sciences in 1861. The pages who are here who have studied history will know that 1861 was the year that President Lincoln took office. So the scientific community has been aware of the greenhouse gas phenomenon since Abraham Lincoln was driving up and down Pennsylvania Avenue in a carriage with his top hat on. So there's not much new that's there. And the, la lo the latest data is uh, clearer and clearer that we just continue apace to warm the planet. Professor Jonathan Overpeck is at the University of Arizona, and Arizona is certainly feeling the heat. Uh, Professor Overpeck says, the global warmth of 2014 is just another reminder that the planet is warming and warming fast. Humans and their burning of fossil fuels are dominating the Earth's climate system like never before. And it's equally clear when we look at the oceans, they not only absorb a lot of the carbon dioxide and acidify as a result, they absorb most of the heat. In fact, they've absorbed 90% of the excess heat that's been trapped by the greenhouse gases that we've flooded our atmosphere with. I certainly see that in Rhode Island. Narragansett Bay's mean winter water temperature is up three to four degrees Fahrenheit since the 1930s when we had our big hurricane of 1938. And um, that's significant because it means more likely storms, it's associated with sea level rise. We have 10 more inches of sea level at the Newport Naval Station. So if the 1938 hurricane were to repeat itself now, it would have 10 more inches of sea to hammer against our shores. And that's not a complicated measure either. We do that with thermometers. So. Since the Industrial Revolution, human beings have dumped 
2 trillion metric tons of carbon dioxide into the air and into the atmosphere. 2 trillion metric tons. That, said another way, is 2,000 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. The notion that has no effect when we've known since Abraham Lincoln's day that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and when we put that much in, and when we can measure that it's at 400 for the first time in human history, I mean, connect the dots. How much does it take? It's really pretty obvious. Folks who remain skeptical, well, I know, I'm not a scientist. I get that. So ask one. That's all I request, and I don't think that's too much to ask of colleagues. And by the way, do me one favor. You can ask the scientists that you please, but please don't ask a scientist who's in the pay of the fossil fuel and the denial industry. There are a bunch of them that are out there. They turn up at all the usual denial conferences. They write in the denial journals. They take money from the denial organizations that all have fossil fuel industry funding behind them. Go to someplace neutral. For instance, go to your own state university, like the University of Arizona, or the University of Oklahoma. The dean of the relevant department at the University of Oklahoma signed the IPCC report and started Climate Central. Ask your own university. Ask any major scientific organization. All the major recognized scientific organizations in the United States of America are on board. Agree that this is real. Agree that this is important. Agree that it is vital. And believe that we're actually near tipping points that may make the damage irrecoverable. If you don't want to go to your home state university, and if you don't want to go to America's major scientific societies, try NOAA and NASA. Think about NASA for a moment. As I give this speech, there is a rover that is the size of an SUV that is being driven around on the surface of Mars. All right? We built a rover, shot it to Mars, landed it safely, and are now driving it around. Do you think those scientists might actually know something? You think they might know what they're talking about? Do you think they might merit our confidence? So ask them and see what they say. Or, if you want, ask some of America's leading corporations. If you are from Arkansas, go and ask Walmart. They will tell you. If you are from Georgia, go and ask Coca-Cola. They will tell you. This is not hard to discover once you get away from that little stable of denial scientists who are so closely affiliated with the fossil fuel industry. I do this every week because we have the arrogance so often here to think how much our laws, the laws that we pass, matter. But the laws that we pass, they are passing things. They come and they go. They have their time. They are repealed. They are replaced. They fall into desuetude. But some laws last. And those are the laws that God laid down upon this earth that guide its operations. Those are the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, the laws of biology, the law of gravity. We cannot repeal those laws. We must face their consequences. And we know that the consequences of continuing to emit gigatons of carbon dioxide into our planet is going to launch us into an environment in which the habitability of the Earth as we have known it will be put into question. History makes its judgments about every generation. And if we do not take calm and reasonable and sensible precautions about this obvious, known, and admitted risk, then when that risk comes home to roost, we will 
be duly shamed. So let us avoid that. Let us get to work. Let us take advantage of the opening that the distinguished senior senator from Alaska and the distinguished senior senator from South Carolina have opened for us. And let us do what is right uh, by our country and by the judgment that we can anticipate from history. I yield the floor.